Chapter Thirteen of the A E F with General Pershing and the American Forces. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The A E F with General Pershing and the American Forces by Haywood Brown. Chapter Thirteen. Hospitals and Engineers. Some of the compliments the mannerly French poured out upon the army left the Americans feeling that they didn't quite deserve them. Others they could take standing. Well to the front of the second lot were all the good works for the medical corps. A leading writer for a big Parisian afternoon paper took the first three columns of his first page to say with undisguised emotion that the French government not merely could, with profit, but should and must pattern after the American Army Medical Service. One good army hospital in France is like another, and so let it be the New York Post graduate unit which was picked at random for the purpose of a visit. We straggled off the train with two old peasant women whose absorbed faces under their peaked white caps did not encourage us to ask our way of them, and one poilu bent under the astonishing miscellany of the home-going French soldier. He lost his chance to escape us by eyeing us with frank if friendly curiosity. Could he direct us to the American Army Hospital, we asked, and he wrinkled his weather-worn nose. No, he hadn't been home since the Americans had come to war, but of course there was only one building in town big enough and new enough to be used by the Americans. If we should turn to the left, and then to the right, and then to the left again, we would come to the school, and there he thought we would find the Americans. We did. To the far end of the little town we trudged till we came to a low stone building, gray and white, of good stout masonry. We knew it was the American hospital, because over the arched entrance there hung a banre étoile. We neared the entrance to the tune of some trumpet blasts, not very well played, and we peered from arch to inner courtyard just in time to see a swarm of khaki half-clad soldiers running out from barracks. By the time they reached the mess door they were khaki-clad. The officer who came to take us about explained that on Sunday mornings everybody slept late and dressed on the way to breakfast, and that discipline was better on weekdays. Then he told us that of all the privates in that unit not one had ever been a soldier before. They had been picked for medical service first, and military service at such time as the officers had learned enough to teach it to them. I remember later that one of the soldiers objected privately to being drilled by a dentist. Nine-tenths of the men were fresh out of college, the officer told us, and half of the other tenth were freshmen or sophomores. Many of the enlisted men, we were told, had left incomes in the tens of thousands, and a few in the hundreds of thousands. The enlisted personnel included one matinee idol, one New York dramatic critic, two middling, well-known young authors, a composer of good but saleable music, and a golfer who gets two in the national rating. The wards were not very different from those of a New York hospital back home, except that they housed a strange mixture of patients. About half were American soldiers, and the rest were civilians from the country round about. The French civilians were convinced that though the American doctors might cure them with their marvelous medicines and speckless cleanliness, they would surely kill them with air. This particular base hospital was fulfilling these two functions for the civilian population. It was seeking to take out adenoids and let in air. A great New York specialist was attending to the adenoids and making progress. It was not always possible to convince the patient that it would do him any good to have his adenoids removed, but if the operation gave the kind American doctor any pleasure, he was willing to let him go ahead. The air campaign was making slower progress. Dislike of air is centuries old in France, and it has become an instinct with the race. I rode in a railroad car with a French aviator on a balmy day of early autumn, and his first action upon entering the compartment was to close both windows. Everybody in this part of France has his bed placed inside a closet, and at night he closes the doors. 
worst of all were the extra precautions against air which the french peasants took in case of illness the young french doctors were at the front and the old men who remained always began the treatment of a case by advising the patient's relatives to close all the windows and start a fire at the call of sick babies and old folk of the countryside came aristocrats of the new york medical profession whose fees at home would have bought the house in which the patient lived later of course the doctors of the hospital will be more rushed by the necessities of the soldiers. "'This is hardly more than a germ of what we plan,' a doctor explained to us. "'Do you see those tents?' he pointed across a small field. "'Those are American engineers, and they're going to do nothing for the next few months but build additions to this hospital. Every time I go away for a day, I come back to find that they've added a thousand beds to the capacity we're planning for. We will extend all the way across the field.' over to that road before they're done with us he spoke in a joyful voice as if nothing in the world was quite so inspiring as a huge hospital filled with patients that was the professional touch i remember the story one of the doctors told us about a young surgeon who was sent up to the french front to help handle the cases after a big drive one of his first patients was a german prisoner who had been shot just above the elbow and bayoneted in the stomach the doctor had no great trouble with the elbow, and he did what he could for the abdominal wound. "'I could save that man all right if it wasn't for that bayonet wound,' he said to another American doctor close at hand, and then he added in a reproachful voice as he pointed to the gash, "'That's an awful dangerous place to stab a man.' There were no wounded at the hospital at the time of our visit, but some of the soldiers in the medical ward were very sick. There was one boy there who has since mended and got away, whose recovery seemed hopeless. The doctor in charge saw that something was troubling the young soldier, and so he came to him and told him that he was aggravating his illness by this worry or desire. "'Whatever this thing is, you must tell me,' said the doctor. "'Do you think I'm going to die?' the boy asked anxiously. "'Oh, I wouldn't say that,' the doctor answered, a little evasively. "'I knew I was pretty sick,' said the boy, catching the evasiveness of the doctor's tone. And if you think I'm going to die and won't ever get back home again, there's just one thing I want to ask you to do for me. What's that? said the doctor. Couldn't you fix it up for me just once to have ham and eggs and apple pie for breakfast? The most important thing in the case of all the sick men was to keep them from brooding about home. The doctors made a point of getting around and talking to the patients to cheer them up. One of them complained of homesickness. Yes, said the doctor, I suppose we all have people back there that we miss. You can just bet I do, said the sick soldier. I've got the finest wife in the world in Des Moines, and two children, and a Ford. The health of the staff was excellent, but sometimes they felt homesick too. The enlisted men gave a show the night I was at the hospital, and during the course of the performance everybody wept, or at least got moist-eyed because the play was about New York. It was laid in a year as nameless as the place where the hospital is located. All the program said was, The Bachelor Apartments of Schuyler Van Allen, on a fine June night, a few weeks after the end of the war. Schuyler had just come back from Europe, and he found his apartment with everything just as it was on the night he had sailed for France. There was the daily paper he had left behind him with the date, May 18, 1917, and he looked at the old sheet and mused as he read some of the headlines. "'Kaiser calls on troops to stand firm,' read Schuyler. "'The Kaiser,' he said to himself, and then he added, "'I wonder whatever became of him.' The audience laughed at that, but in a moment the doctors and the nurses and the patients who weren't sick enough to stay in bed wept. It was all because Schuyler looked out of the window and said to his friend, "'Oh, it's great to be on Fifth Avenue again.' I want to see it in every light and at every hour of the day. It was fairly blazing tonight, with the same old hurrying crowd jamming the traffic of 42nd Street, and the same old mob pushing and shoving its way into the Grand Central Subway Station. The mention of the subway was too much for the audience. By this time the nurse who sat in front of me was dabbing violently at her eyes with her pocket handkerchief. She was breaking my heart, and I leaned forward to ask, what part of New York do you come from? I wasn't ever in New York, she said. I come from Lima, Ohio. 
like the medical corps the engineers were peculiarly american and peculiarly efficient as well we first came upon them when we saw a tall stringy man looking out of the window of a little locomotive which pulled a train up to a point at the french front we thought he was american because his jaws were moving back and forth slowly and meditatively inquiry brought confirmation sure i'm an american said the man in the blue jumpers i guess i've kicked a hobo off the train for every telegraph pole back on the old rock island but this is the toughest railroading job i've struck yet the man in the locomotive was a member of an american regiment of railroad engineers which had taken over an important military road they had the honor to be the first american troops at the french front who came under fire the engineers were willing to admit that while washouts and spreading rails were old stories to them they did get a bit of a thrill the first time they found their tracks torn up by shell-fire, but the aeroplanes were worse. One night, said our friend the engineer, there was one of those flying machines just followed along with us, and every time we fired the engine and the sparks flew up, she'd drop a bomb on us or shoot at us with her machine-gun. We tried to hit it up a bit, but she kept right with us. They didn't hit us but once they got so rough we just slowed down and laid under the engine for a spell until they decided to quit picking on us. The regiment of railroad engineers was the huskiest outfit I saw in France. It was carefully selected from the railroads running into Chicago. Of the men originally selected, only about one-seventh were taken, because the railroads found so many men who were eager to go. One company boasted one hundred and twenty-five six-footers and all were two-fisted fighters. The discipline of the regiment, of course, was not that of an infantry unit. I watched an animated discussion between a captain and his men as to where some material should be placed when the regiment first moved into a new camp. "'You've got the wrong dope about that, Bill,' said a privateer's captain very earnestly. The officer looked at him severely. "'I've told you before about this discipline business, Harry,' he said. Any time you want to kick about my orders, you call me Mr. It is hard for a railroad man to realize that a couple of silver bars have changed a yardmaster into a captain. The regiment set great store by the number 13. It was put into service on a Friday the 13th, and it left its American base in two sections of 13 cars each. The locomotive's headlight numbers each totaled 13, and the 13th of a month found the regiment arriving at its European point of entry. The 13th of the next month found the regiment starting for its French base, and when the camp was reached, a group of interpreters was waiting. "'How many are you?' asked the colonel. "'Myself and twelve companions,' replied one of the Frenchmen. The regiment will never forget the first night at its French base. It arrived at midnight, but crowds thronged the darkened streets, and gave the big Americans an enthusiastic greeting although it was forbidden to talk above undertones. Since they could not hurrah for the soldiers, the villagers hugged them, and from black windows roses were pelted on shadowy figures, who tramped up the street to the low rumble of a muffled band. "'Great people, these French, so demonstrative,' said a captain, who was once a trainmaster in a Texas town. "'I was in the theatre the other night,' he said, and a couple of performers on the stage started to sing, Madeleine. Well, I'd heard it before, and I knew the chorus, so when they got that far along, I joined in. Well, there was a young girl sitting next to me, and when she saw I knew the song, she just threw her arms around my neck and kissed me. And now, said the captain, everybody in the regiment's after me to teach em that song. End of chapter 13